Hey everyone, it's Norm Ferrar, AKA The Beard Guy here, and welcome to another Lunch with Norm, the e-commerce and Amazon FBA podcast. Okay, today's episode, we're gonna be talking about how to become customer-centric in your e-commerce business. We're gonna also talk about like, what the heck is a toilet bowl thinking, or what the heck is toilet bowl thinking, why you should see things from your customer's point of view, and how to become customer-centric. Okay, welcome to another Lunch with Norm, the e-commerce and F Amazon FBA podcast. Lunch with Norm. Lunch with Norm. Lunch with Norm. Lunch with Norm. Anybody who's watched this podcast knows I always talk about customer service and the customer experience. So I love the topic today, how to become customer centric in your e-commerce business. Our guest is the CEO of Orion Digital, and he is very well versed in e-commerce, especially since he is an e-commerce entrepreneur and a coach. His sites have generated over 75 million in worldwide sales, and his clients have a combined turnover of over 100 mil. He's also the host of the e-commerce podcast, where he chats with experts in the field of e-commerce and how to grow and develop your online business. I am talking about our first time guest, Matt Edmondson. Edmondson. <laughs> sorry, Matt. <laughs> That's a, I, oh my gosh, I'm so sorry. Anyways, before I get to Matt, let's talk to uh, one of our sponsors. A big thank you to our sponsor, Startup Club, the largest club on Clubhouse with over 790,000 members and growing. They're one of the world's largest communities supporting the startup ecosystem from founders to those wishing to work for a startup and everything in between. You can find them at www.startup.club for blogs, recordings, and a calendar of upcoming shows and on the Clubhouse app. Just search Startup Club for daily shows 24-7. You can also now listen to their show, The Serial Entrepreneur Club Podcast, on Apple and Spotify, too. Stop by to connect, learn, and grow together. Okay, so let's see. I see that we already have Rad, Rad's in Mumbai today. That's awesome. M yeah, Rad. yeah, Rad. Rad's been doing some traveling, I believe, for the last couple of months. So it's good to see Rad back. We've uh, we've missed you. Yeah, in the comment section. You should go meet Vandana. I talked to her a, a bunch on the uh, podcast. She's over in Mumbai as well. But uh, anyways, Andrew, oh Colombia, oh my gosh, and of course there's Connor from Texas. All right, guys. Well, welcome to the uh, podcast today. We've got a great podcast. We'll be talking um, to Matt shortly, but um, Kelsey. Uh, what do you got to say? All right. So you guys know the drill. We start off with smashing those like buttons, giving us a thumbs up wherever you're watching from. So whether that's the Facebook group, Facebook page, or YouTube channel, make sure you subscribe, follow, give us a like. And uh, yeah, if you're new to the podcast, we do this every single week, Monday, Wednesday, Friday at 12 p.m. Eastern time. Uh, it's a completely live podcast. So if you have questions for our guests or for Norm, or me even, you can uh, put them over in the comment section and uh, we can answer them throughout the episode. Usually we wait till the second half of the podcast to get to the questions. Um, but yeah, make sure you get your questions in early um, so we get to them uh, because sometimes we run out of time and we can't get to everyone all the time. But anyways, join our Facebook group too, Lunch with Norm, Amazon FBA and e-commerce collective. Uh, we've got a bunch of our podcast guests in that group as well. Um, so it's a great place to network as well as our members are there too. So anyone you see commenting during the episode, I can pretty much guarantee that they're in the Facebook group too. Uh, so join, you get discounts, um, you get to participate in our polls or questions, get to know the community a bit better. And uh, if you have questions with Amazon Ecom, it's a great place to get your uh, questions answered. So links are in the descriptions, um, so you can visit it there as well. All right. Better. Very good. Like Kelsey was saying, just throw your questions or comments over into the comment section. We usually run out of time before we get to all the questions and then they'll just go over to our Facebook group and we'll try to answer them there. So let's sit back, relax, grab a cup of coffee and enjoy the episode. Welcome Matt 
Edmundson. <laughs> Thanks, Norm. <laughs> it's great to be here. How are you doing? <laughs> I, I'm doing great. <laughs> Anyways, it's live. And I guess this is why people love live. Like, that's why people watch NASCAR, NASCAR right? So people yeah. can see the accidents. Well, live <laughs> when you make all these bloopers. We have a huge blooper reel. Anyway. Oh, I, I can imagine. <laughs> I can imagine. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Anyways, I hope I covered it properly. Now, it is Orion, right? You're did. Uh, to be fair, when we set up the business, Norm, yeah, uh, I, I didn't think. You know what? I should go and get one of those names that no one can actually pronounce. But that's what we ended up doing. Uh, it's pronounced Orion. Uh, oh, okay. There we go. But uh, yeah, everyone pronounces it Orion. So maybe I should just change the name. <laughs> <laughs> so you know, you've got this. It, First of all, you've got the podcast, then you've got the uh, the coaching side of things, and then you've got these incredible, crazy sales, like seventy five million in sales. I guess it's combined on the on your sites. Mm -hmm. You want to talk a little bit about you know what you're doing? Yeah, sure. I I am. Um, uh, where do we start? Right. So I just love e commerce. I got into it. Uh, I built my first e commerce website in two thousand two. So 20, I'm a twenty year veteran now, which in in digital terms is a really long time. Right. Uh, I think you measure digital years in dog years, don't you? It's the same kind of thing. So <laughs> yeah, <laughs> I should be dead. <laughs> Well, maybe we shouldn't then, because that's not. Yeah. <laughs> so yeah, I've been around twenty years, and um, I, I just fell in love with e-commerce the first time I built an e-commerce website back in two thousand two. I actually built that site and then sold it pretty quickly. Um, huh. Such was the world back then. Yeah, it was crazy. Um, and then over the years, we've bought and sold and um, stuff online of, through various sites and guises. Um, and yeah, if I total it all up, it's horrendous amounts of money. Uh, and I just sit here very blessed and lucky to be able to, to be able to talk to you about it. Very good. Yeah. One of the things that we're doing, and it, it's all about the podcast. So there's lots of Amazon information. There's lots of different information from different types of um, e-commerce, but I'm, I don't want to get stuck in a rut. Mm -hmm. So we just started recently going full circle, going back to arbitrage. So we're doing okay. some drop shipping, we're mm -hmm. doing some arbitrage, and we're doing it in ways where it's never been done before. It's not hard. Mm -hmm. And we're, we're going to be um, showing people what we're doing. But we're do what we're trying to do is expose people to all aspects of e-com and Amazon. Yeah. Uh, and you don't want to just focus on one because let's say you might not have the money to run a proper e-commerce site or an Amazon FBA site. You don't have the inventory. Maybe you want to check out other things. And there are so many other possibilities when you're getting into this. And that's why I love it. You could get into monetization, monetizing anything. Mm -hmm. We're just starting to do some stuff with affiliate um, on the ser service side of things with my other company. And, uh, yeah, I just love e-com. You know, you can go so many different oh, ways. Oh, you can, can't you? You really can. It's an extraordinary market because it's relatively straightforward to get started, I yep. think. Um, it's it's not as easy as it was when we started out to 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 do well quickly. I mean, you've, you've, you've got to have a little bit of um, planning and, and creativity, I think, if you're launching a new site uh, to, to do well. But that said, I think it's relatively straightforward to do well in e-commerce. Um, but the path that it it brings to you and the opportunities, um, I never thought that I would be doing coaching, for example. But it, it I get to, I, I sit here and still pinch myself a little bit. I get to fly all over the world. Yeah. Literally all over the world, talking to clients and helping them grow online, right? And it's, and, and one thing sort of leads to another. And, and that's the beauty, I think, of this industry is you can, it, it you, I mean, you do it. You do the podcast, you do the public speaking, you do the coaching, you've got your own businesses. I'm the same. Do you know what I mean? I, I think you're, in effect, my my brother in Canada, just by the sounds of what you do. And so you kind of think, well, yeah, all these things just sort of come out of this, uh, this one thing called Ecom, which is fantastic. What I love about it, too, um, it's still a great community. 
Mm -hmm. There's so many other uh, niches or, or other types of business that you go to and it's really cutthroat. Uh, I find that uh, there's a lot of friendly competition here. Mm -hmm. the, the one thing that I, I think, uh, at least with the Amazon sellers, is they got to come out of their shell with holding back. If I went to a trade show back in the day and I went out with my friendly competitors, I would share. They knew what I was doing. I knew what they were doing. It wasn't mm -hmm. a big deal. They knew my brand. I'd be, a, I'd have a booth. Yeah. And here, if you tuck it under your sleeve, uh, I don't think you're getting the same exposure. So I've got a buddy of mine. I don't know if, if you know him. He's in the Amazon world more than e-com, which Amazon's still e-com. But yeah. uh, his name's Kevin King. Mm -hmm. And we ended up on a beach in Hawaii smoking a cigar, talking about our products, which were the same. So he had one way of marketing. I had another way of marketing. He had a really great idea for yeah. a unique item. Anyways, it turns out that we both drove traffic over to the search results page. And if I got the, the sale, so be it. If he did, so be it. But mm -hmm. one way or the other, we were all driving traffic, which meant there was a lot more opportunity. Yeah, there was. You know, so, so anyways. Yeah, there's that phrase, isn't there? When the tide rises, we all ride together with it. Um, exactly. And I think it's it's a very true statement in the world of e -com. It's too small, actually, uh, not, to, not to acknowledge that actually this is a community. You should really get to know who your competitors are. Go out for a beer with them. Do you know what I mean? And, and, and have that sort of network. I think it makes an awful lot of sense. Norm, I have to be honest. There's going to be jerks. Yeah. You know, but there's a lot of good people out there too. Mm -hmm. yeah. But, you know, today's one of my favorite topics. I talk a lot about, uh, you can have the greatest uh, listing in the world, greatest images, lifestyle, your, everything's optimized to a T. If your product sucks or if it arrives and it sucks, then guess what? You're not going to get a repeat order. Mm -hmm. So customer service, customer centric, you know, that whole customer experience. I love this topic. So why don't we start talking about the overall, how to become a customer centric company? Yeah. Why so not? Let's, let's dig into that. All right. So one of the things that I saw that I that got my curiosity up was this whole thing about toilet bowl thinking. What <laughs> What is toilet bowl thinking? Yeah, yeah, yeah. To well, we, we call it toilet seat marketing is the official language. And actually, because uh, those that are watching, uh, you can see I, I actually have by the side of my desk uh, a prop, uh, which I've used on, on many occasions. There was one occasion I was doing, a, 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 during the time of COVID, we were doing the seminars, but doing them online. And I had a bunch of... Um, well, let's just say they were very expensive doctors uh, wanting to understand why digital worked. And we sent them a toilet seat and made them sit on the toilet seat whilst we were doing the talk just to get their ideas and to get the thinking into their, you know, this actually is quite an important thing. And the story goes, there is a story attached to it. Oh, I'm sorry. Uh, the story goes uh, that a good friend of mine, a guy called Rich Rising, he spent his college years working in a hotel. Uh, to raise some extra cash. And during that time, he would clean the toilet stalls, okay? And so you kind of picture it in your head, right? There's a toilet stall, you open the door, you clean the walls, there's a toilet in front of you, you clean the toilet and away you go. And that's how everybody did it. Uh, but Rich, when the customer, when asking the customers, Rich was the one that always got the highest accolades. Now, granted, this was cleaning toilets. Did anyone really care? Well, actually, the other guys did. They were like, how come you always win? We clean those toilets just as well as you. We're in there the same amount of time. What's going on? And so Rich says, well, show me how you clean the toilets. And so they go in, they open the door, they clean the walls, they clean the toilet. And Rich says, well, I do exactly the same thing apart from one other thing. And that is I turn around and I sit down on said toilet seat and I look at the toilet stall from the customer's point of view. He said, because here you have the most important viewpoint. And he said, I sit here on the toilet and I clean from this point of view. So, of course, when the customers go in and use the toilet, they're not seeing it necessarily how all the cleaners are seeing it. They're seeing it how Rich sees it. 
And so this led to this whole idea of toilet seat marketing, which I totally plagiarized uh, from that story. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and it's just this whole idea of what we get so tunnel visioned in our business. And like you say, optimize everything to the hilt. But sometimes it's just worth turning around and sitting down and going, what does this look like from my customer's point of view? And it's a really simple question. And I know in theory, we've asked it ourselves a thousand times. The reality of it is we, we don't actually, I don't think we've probably done a deep enough dive into that topic. So uh, I'm glad we're talking about it. That's what toilet seat marketing is all about, the, the toilet the sitting on the toilet seat. You know, that's interesting uh, that you say that. This week, uh, I've been talking about this uh, product launch we were doing last week. And one of the things... I'm, I'm looking at it. I'm approving everything. And then somebody on our team said, wait a second, don't you always say, and I'm looking at it going, how did I miss it? Uh, this would have brought out like, uh, and I'm talking about, I was focusing on features mm -hmm. rather than benefits. Mm -hmm. And somebody on the team just said, why don't we change this around? Why are we not focusing on a uh, benefit rather than the feature? We can mm -hmm. still keep the feature on the listing. And it was like, ah, oh, yeah, I was just too close to the project. Mm -hmm. And I was looking at like this really gorgeous looking product. And I thought, oh, wow, this is really cool rather than the benefit, which is going to would have cost me sales. Mm -hmm. So I love what you're saying on the customer standpoint. And one of the things, um, do you do this? Do you order your competitors products to see what they're All doing? All the time. Do All you? the time. I'm their best customer. Yeah. Yeah, I think it's so important mm -hmm. if, if you can see what they're doing. And also, if they have um, an insert or anything I can sign up for, mm -hmm. I'm there. Like, give me all your spam. Yeah, give me your emails. Give yeah. me whatever you're going to send. I'm, I'm, a, I'm really, really curious. Yeah, yeah, totally. So what do you do? What are your first steps in going forward? You're sitting on the toilet seat looking at the stall. What are you doing now? Yeah, there's there's a lot of things you've got to think about, right? So we have this um, uh, we have this exercise. We, it's yeah. got a it's got a, 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 a poncy name. We call it touch points because you've got to call it something, right? Uh, and so you just you go to a whiteboard or a, a, a piece of paper or you know a, a note on your computer and you write down every single touch point that your customer has with you. Okay, every single touch point. Where do they connect with you? From Facebook ads to the landing pages to your checkouts. Where do, uh, when they receive the products, when they receive your emails, what are all these touch points where your customers uh, connect with you? And then you want to classify those. Which ones are digital touch points, and which ones are real touch points? You know, digital. I appreciate is is real, but it's not. It's a, I, we use the word real as in terms of physical. You know, mm -hmm. what are the physical touch points? Uh, and you want to write all of those down, brainstorm them with your team, get everybody to think about what those touch points are. And then you want to spend a whole bunch of time looking at each one of those touch points, but from the point of view of your customer, not the point of view. You. A classic example of this uh, was we were doing a seminar in New Zealand. And I was doing a seminar in the hotel where... Um, Oh, Shackleton sort of set sail from to go to the North Pole, uh, the South Pole. Uh, it's a beautiful venue, probably the best venue I've ever spoken in my whole life. Uh, and we were doing this um, touch point thing. There was an accountant in the room and they, they said, well, I, I, you know, these are the touch points and this, our website's really good. And so I'm like, awesome, let's pull your website up. So he pulled his website up, put it on the big screen. And on his home page was a photograph of his uh logo right so you had his logo really big on the page and then underneath that you had the same logo but it was a picture of that logo on the side of his building okay and it was a carousel image and so the next image was a photograph of a business card with his logo on, <laughs> right and so <laughs> I, we, I was i was just tickled pink i'm like well this is great from your point of view because obviously you're really proud of your logo but <laughs> But let me just as a customer, I don't care about your logo. I don't care if you're a family business and I don't care what year you started. I just want to know, can you help me with my tax? Yes or no. And so it was this 
it, it took a while for him to understand that actually, when you look at it from your customer's point of view, what is important to you might not be that important to them. Uh, and so you have to understand the story from their point of view and go, well, actually, what's important to the customer here? So things like actually putting a big head, making the logo smaller and putting a big headline going, it's coming up to the end of the year, stressed out with worry, no worries, we can take care of your tax for you. Well, I'm not a great copywriter, Norm, but that is an awful lot better than a picture of the logo on the side of your building underneath a big version of your logo. Right. Yeah, absolutely. I um, I I was working with this uh, company. It was a luxury brand coming, kind of like the Rob Rob Report. Mm -hmm. uh, anyways, the editor. He had a a beautiful magazine, but if you went to the website. First of all, the first page was okay, but the bottom half of the first page was about the editor. It was, I, it's going to sound crazy, but it was around 13 pages of copy. Mm. Scroll, 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 scroll. And he was wondering why the site wasn't converting. <laughs> and you're like, well, okay, yeah. So, and by the way, after I told him about the issue that, and you have to be gentle, right? So I'm, mm -hmm. I'm kind of saying, you know, being really political. Um, but I, I told him that you had to, that we, we have to do something about that. Well, he didn't ever do it. Nothing he did do. He, he wanted to keep the 13 mm -hmm. pages of copy. And it was the same 13 pages of copy that he had in the about us section. Yeah. So I, you know, I know we're talking about, you know, becoming customer centric, but I tell you, if you want to drive customers away, do something like that, mm -hmm. you know, but I, yeah, I like what you're talking about. You know, if, uh, if you're all of us as entrepreneurs, um, you know, people that have micro brands, we all have egos, but sometimes you've, you, you've got to check it at the door mm -hmm. and do what you're doing and just, yeah, just sit back and realize what is your customer looking at? Mm -hmm. And I just love what you said about that toilet seat analogy. It was really cool. Yeah, it works. It sticks in people's minds, doesn't it? Yeah. And actually, part of the team, uh, part of our team meetings, it's like, okay, everybody get the toilet seats out. Uh, put them on your chair and sit on them. Uh, just to just something physical. To It sounds a bit odd and a bit weird. But actually, as, a, as an idea, it's really great because you're thinking, no, I've got to think about this from the customer's point of view now. Uh, what do they think and what do they what what how do they feel when they when they interact with this particular touch point right what's going on here uh, but yeah it's it's super cool so you've done you've kind of uh, you you've addressed the touch points and now you're you're kind of going through every single touch point what's the next step you can do so there <clears throat> The same friend that told me about the toilet seat, Rich Rising, yeah. um, he drew on a piece of paper for me one day, a triangle. Uh, and at the top of the, the top point of that triangle, he wrote the word price. And then on the two lower points, he wrote uh, service and he wrote quality. Right. So you've got price, service and quality. Um, and he said to me, he said, Matt, every business uh, has sort of to think about these three things, what price they sell their product for, what level of customer service they're going to give, <clears throat> and the, the product itself, you know, how good is the actual product? What's the quality of the product? And he said, what you can't do is you can't get a high quality product, so sell it for a low price and have high customer service. You can't, you can't get all three. And so he said, you need to pick two. OK, so what are you going to, you know, what, what's your business going to be? What kind of business model? So in 2012, um, we were turning over about four and a half million, somewhere around that online uh, sterling. So uh, what's that, about five dollars at the moment, <laughs> given the exchange rate. Uh, but we, you know, we were talking, we, we're, tur we're turning over several million online and we built the business on the basis of we had a quality product, but we were selling it at, the, at a very low price. And so we had very little margin. So our customer service, it was meh. It was okay, but it just wasn't earth shatteringly good. And I remember sitting down going, something's got to change. And we committed uh, to becoming a, 
a sort of a quality product, but a service led business. So it's quite a significant change. And to do that, it meant our prices had to increase. And so for the first 12 months uh, of this change where we invested in customer service, and I'll quite happily tell you some of the stories, which were amazing, uh, where we invested in customer service, our sales at the end of that year had fallen, right? They'd not gone up, they'd fallen. And I'm like, I have totally messed up in some respects, but I thought, you know what, I'm sticking to my guns here. The following year, our sales grew by a significant amount, like over 20 odd percent, uh, more than they'd ever grown before. And what we realized was that actually the people who were price hunting weren't buying from us. But the people that wanted good customer service not only bought from us once, but they bought from us again. It just took sort of 12 to 18 months for those repeat purchases to filter through if that makes sense. So when we looked at the data, we'd lost sales in the first year, but in the second year, we just we just hit it, man, did we hit it running. And so by the end of that second year, we were doing over 6 million. It was crazy uh, how it was working. Uh, and so to come back to your original question, I think you've got to determine when you when you look at this, actually how serious are you about customer service? What kind of level do you want? Um, because you can just do meh, you can just do the basics. Um, or you can really go to town and do something quite unique and special. You know, you're, when you were talking about the three circles and one of them being customer service, uh, on the podcast, I talk about uh, coming out and knowing the pricing tier you should come out at. Mm -hmm. And a lot of that could be driven by the customer service level or by the optimization. Exactly what you said about those circles. You can have two, but you can't have three. And depending on which two that you have um, is where you come out. So here's a, an example for you, a Dead Sea Mud. So Dead Sea Mud, tier one, and this is for every product I've ever seen that I've done product uh, um, research on, is that it'll come at low level and it'll be $6 to $14. Second level mm -hmm. will be 20 to 40. The third level will be uh, 70 to 95. And these are true prices, by the way. Okay. Based on those circles, if you're if you're using part of them as quality, not so much the price. I don't care about the price, but the quality um, and the customer service. You can go at the first level, and you mm -hmm. can match up those other two circles each way you want. Uh, but it's if you're not putting out customer service and it's just the um, the price and possibly the quality, you'll be down towards more of the bottom. Mm -hmm. Anyways. What I'm trying to say is by doing what you were just saying with the quality or with those three cir th circles, you can figure out which perceived value in the tiers that you want to come out in. Mm -hmm. And it's it's just kind of a different way of looking at it. Um, yeah. I don't I don't know if you get that, but, you know, mm -hmm. it's just something that we do all the time. Where do you want to bring out your product? First, second or third tier. And that tells us which one of those two circles we're going to go with. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's very good. And I imagine, Norman, correct me if I'm wrong, that perhaps the, the, the more profitable and more sustainable businesses tend to be the ones that operate in the higher tiers and not the lower ones. Absolutely. So one of the things that you'll find comes all back to customer service. It comes back to that customer experience. But the ones that are just trading dollars uh, or nickels and dimes getting sales volume typically aren't the ones they they're just looking for volume mm -hmm. and typically they don't care what their listings look like. They don't care about the customer service. They're the ones that you can't get customer service for the most part. Mm -hmm. The ones up at top that have way more margin, tons more margin. Well, it could be the same dead sea mud. It just, it looks better and they mm -hmm. get better overall customer service. Yeah, so absolutely. just on that note, oh my God. <laughs> oh my God. My dog stole an egg <laughs> from upstairs and he just brought it downstairs in his mouth. Wow. It's not a I... hard boiled egg. This is. Oh, okay. All right. What Obviously thought you were a bit peckish. Normally. Yeah, I guess <laughs> that's a first. <laughs> but, but, wow, lucky you didn't bite on it. Anyways, 
if you, anybody listening, so I see Marshall's here now too. Anybody listening, um, if you do have uh, any type of customer experiences, customer service experiences, good, bad, or ugly, let us know. I'd really love to hear your customer experience or how you are, are working with and building up your customer centric business. Now, we do have a giveaway today. Uh, Matt, do you want to talk a little bit about uh, the giveaway? Yeah, sure. I'm sorry. I'm just giggling at one of the comments, which came first, the egg or the dog. Uh, <laughs> I thought <laughs> that was just popped up on the screen. Um, uh, so, yeah, I am just about to launch uh, something called the e-commerce cohort, which is like a it's like a mastermind. It's a lightweight mastermind group, uh, sort of a monthly membership type thing where um where we go through the what I think are the six sort of key areas of e-commerce and we go through them on a monthly basis and you work you know on your business you work with uh, sort of those in e-commerce and you you it's a group thing it's peer accountability all the good stuff that you you know you want as an e-commerce entrepreneur um, so yeah we're going to give away a free membership to the cohort that is fantastic so I think everybody knows the drill but if you're new Hashtag Wheel of Kelsey, tag two people, and you'll get a second entry today. So before we come back, we just got to cut away to a sponsor. A big thank you to our sponsor, Post Purchase Pro, the only complete A to Z done for you real email and text marketing service built specifically for Amazon sellers. My friends, Sean Hart and Seth Stevens co-founded Post Purchase Pro after launching over a thousand successful private labeled products, growing 53 brands, and get this, exiting 17 businesses. Post Purchase Pro creates all of your digital assets 100% for you from marketing inserts, complete sales funnels, email follow up sequences, and weekly email promotions. They manage and optimize everything for you to drive more sales, get higher ranking and receive more reviews on Amazon. So check out Post Purchase Pro now to see if you too will see enormous growth like their nearly 500 clients worldwide. That's Post Purchase Pro at postpurchasepro.com slash lunch. You know, one of the things that, uh, that we do just to get feedback from who our audience would be is to give away a lot of product. Mm -hmm. And so we're just giving product away to our audience and we say, you know, can you give us some feedback? Yeah. Sometimes what happens uh, is that turns out to become a marketplace review. So mm -hmm. we'll ask four or five questions. So oh, I sell beauty products. So yep. it's the receiving the product. Mm -hmm. What do you think about the packaging? What do you think about the scent? What do you mm -hmm. think? Mm -hmm. Get their ideas. And then, when they go and they use it for 30 days, we go back and we, we you know, how does your skin feel? Blah, 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 mm -hmm. blah. But we could use that as a marketplace review and cut that. It, and it costs a bit of money. But we're hoping that we're going to be marketing this product where we're going to be getting, you know, some really good return on our money. Yeah, but yeah. That allows us to get the marketplace reviews so we can use them as testimonials. We can use them in lifestyle images. and that gives us a really great, some really great feedback about mm. what we have to improve. So, or not improve. Maybe there's, you know, maybe it's, it's all good. That's never mm -hmm. happened. And one other thing that I've noticed is that there's, I try based on our customer reviews or customer feedback to consistently change the product. It could be on the packaging. It could mm -hmm. be the smell. It could be getting rid of a scent. It could be adding a scent. Uh, uh, Connie. Yes. Thank you. Are you laying eggs? I am laying eggs. <laughs> Jeez. <laughs> so, <laughs> at, least, at least you didn't break it. Oh my God. <laughs> Anyways, yeah. My wife just came down and grabbed the egg. <laughs> <laughs> Obviously, needs that for lunch. Then. Uh, that's yeah. That's where he got it from. So missing an egg. <laughs> um, that's not the first time that's happened, by the way. Anyways, I, that's one of the things that we do. And I, this is leading like to my next question is what are some of the things that you do that you can create this customer-centric um, lifestyle around your product? 
I think what you've said is very wise, Norm, to be fair. And actually, the even before you start and you're researching a product, one of the things that you should do is read all your competitors' reviews, right? And mm, all the reviews right. on Amazon, because that's going to give you the edge when it, you want to know what to do with your product. Like, okay, well, everyone's complaining about this. So, and everyone loves this feature. I need that feature and I need to fix this one that's broken, you know? And it's, it's amazing research, really. <laughs> this is there for free uh, if you're just willing to read through it. So I think that's very wise. I think there's a couple of things that we did um, was that really made a massive difference. Um, number one, we empowered our customer service team. Uh, now, granted, I had a team. Uh, it wasn't just me as a as sort of solo guy, but we had a customer service team and we empowered them. What I mean by that is uh, it used to be that if someone wanted an order refunding, then the, the guy who took the call then had to go and get the permission of somebody else to refund it. Do you know what I mean? So we just didn't, it was just standard practice, you know, the what you've got to go talk to the manager, and blah, blah, blah. And you make it difficult and affect people to get refunds. So what we did was we wrote on a, on a piece of paper in very big letters um, a phrase which said, listen, we will give our customers a service that they would like but rarely encounter. Um, and the way we recognized this was there was one question that the, the, the team had to ask when they were listening to the person on the other end of the phone. And that was, if I was in this same situation, what would I want from this company? And it was a really, it's a simple question, uh, treat others as you would want to be treated. I think the, the wisdom is 2000 years old. Um, but it worked insanely well. And so we had a guy called Greg, who used to work with us uh, in the beauty business, actually, we sold beauty stuff on them. Uh, I sold the beauty business last year. Uh, so I've been in beauty for a long time, Norm, as you can mm -hmm. tell. Uh, obviously. Uh, <laughs> and so uh, one time, uh, you know, a, 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 a gentleman called up, uh, spoke to Greg and said, listen, it was on a Friday. He called upon a Friday and he said, listen, my order's not arrived. And he was a bit he was a bit annoyed on the phone, you know, that sort of angry customer service. Um, and Greg's like, OK, let me just check your order. Oh, I see you took the free shipping. Uh, the free shipping is like a you know, two to three day delivery time. So it should probably be with you by Tuesday. The latest I would have thought is everything OK. And then the guy went, no, not everything is OK. It's my wife's birthday tomorrow. And that was her birthday gift. Well, Greg, being a newly married man, instantly felt the pain of said customer on the phone uh, and thought, oh, geez, you know, uh, happy wife, happy life was his mantra. And so it was like, we've got to sort this out. And so he resent the order. He didn't get permission to do this. He didn't talk to his manager, didn't talk to me, didn't talk to anybody. He resent the order. And at the time he sent it, he sent it so it would arrive by nine o'clock on Saturday morning, which was the most expensive courier delivery option we as a company could pay for it. It was, it was an awful lot of money. Not only that, Greg went and wrapped every single product. So when the guy got the parcel uh, early that morning, he could just give it to his wife because it was already wrapped. He wrote a birthday card out to the gentleman's wife and got everybody to sign this card and just said, happy birthday, you know, from all of us. Um, and he put some chocolates in the box and he sent that out on a nine o'clock delivery. Uh, and the first I hear about it, Norm, was on the Monday when the guy calls the office and he's like, I need to speak to uh, the boss, please. And so he ends up on the phone with me and I'm like, how, how can I help you? But, and he was like, let me tell you a story. And he just tells me the story that I've just told you. He is in tears on the phone telling me this story. And I want you to know all the rest of their years of buying beauty products, where did they buy them from, right? Yeah. They bought them from our website. But I sat down and I, sa I said to Greg, I said, listen, well done, bud. Um, but I also sat down and worked out what the cost of that was to me as a, as a company. Right. And I worked out, you know, by the time we'd accounted for the shipping and collecting the parcel that we'd sent out, but, you know, wanted it back and all that sort of stuff. We were out like 30 bucks. Right. The whole thing cost me 30 bucks. But I, I tell you what, I got that back and more from that that guy, you know, and Greg was brilliant at this. He was like he would think all the time, what is it they want? What would I want in this situation? He was the only customer service guy I'd ever come across where. <laughs> A lot of the customers would send him gifts, usually around Christmas, um, and they sent him cashmere sweaters and all kinds of stuff wow. just because he gave good customer service. And when these things came in, 
and we we'd see them you know greg with a new cashmere sweater and we were like oh my does your wife know about this <laughs> that you're getting all these gifts from uh, from all these ladies buying beauty products but he was he was great at it and so that was the first thing that we did we empowered our staff the wet house staff had the same had the same thing we had this thing called schmocks uh, which stood for sexy moments of customer service, smocks. Uh, and we empowered everyone in, in the warehouse and said, listen, if it costs less than 50 quid, I don't care what you do, just go ahead and do it. Um, it just has to be, and or it has to create what I call the sexy moment of customer service. I had to create a smock. And so we had a lady, Nicola, in the warehouse. Um, she would, because she was in the warehouse, she would start to recognize names of people buying stuff from us on a regular basis so she would put handwritten notes in the boxes she started to understand a bit more about who they were she'd send them gifts on their birthday um she she had this crazy idea one easter um this was going back 10 12 years ago before everybody did it she's like why don't we put a cadbury's cream egg in everybody's box because it's easter and easter's a joyous time isn't it and so we were like yeah let's go do that i was driving a mini at the time right <laughs> I went down to Costco to fill this car up with uh, Cadbury's cream <laughs> eggs. My kids were finding them for months afterwards. <laughs> <laughs> they were very excited. So, yeah, empower your staff. Uh, empower the team uh, to really deliver customer service that they would like uh, in that situation. If you can employ good people and you can trust them, it's brilliant because you don't have to monitor it. You don't have to do anything. And let me tell you, the repeat business is, is phenomenal when you do that. What a story. I, I love, I was expecting to hear, oh, I did a handwritten note. I did a gift card. But you went one step further and even further. And that 30 bucks, how many people did the wife tell? How mm -hmm. many people did the husband tell? So it's not only that couple that came back to you for the business, uh, for your beauty business. Mm -hmm. I don't know how many, but you probably got that tenfold from other people. Oh, without a doubt. Without yeah. a doubt. Yeah, I, we just couldn't measure it. I just know that I would rather spend 30 bucks doing that than 30 bucks on Facebook ads. Right, right. And uh, Amazon, we get, people know the system. They know, oh, if I put in this complaint, I'll get to keep the product basically without returning it. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you, you know, I'll... I'll just get the product. So people, Amazon's, a lot of Amazon sellers have become a little um, callous. Mm -hmm. But you can't be. Those 1% that are going to do that to you, let them do that. You're not going to mm -hmm. change them. But the people that you can go out there and do what you just did, that'll make up for those that that small percentage that's going to play the system. And mm -hmm. even if those are the people receiving the bloody chocolates, you know, or the thank you note or the follow up, they'll change. I mm -hmm. I, I really do think that you could they'll come back and maybe they're not going to try to scam you. So, it's, you know, who knows? Who knows? Who know, you're right. Who know you're not going to win everybody. No. Right? No. Um and and that's okay, like you say. They're not your ideal client. You focus on your best clients. You treat them like royalty. And I mean, you know, you, don't get me wrong. The customer is not always right. And there are, you know, we have to think about the customer. We have to think about our team and we have to think about the company. There are times and occasions where I've said to people, I don't think we're the right company from you. I think you should buy from somebody else. And here's yeah. a here's a great company that you can buy from. Right. Um because I have to protect the, the team and the staff and I have to think about all of these things. So I don't think the customer is always right, but I do think if you treat people how you would like to be treated, well, it's the best form of marketing advice I think I've ever been given or ever read or found. You know, it's, it's, it's unbelievable the lengths that people would go to. We did, this, um, we did this thing with touch points. We were like, right, let's, one of our touch points was obviously when people received the parcel from us, you know, they, they got the product and we were thinking, why are people buying from us? Why are they buying this product? Cause this was expensive skincare, right? It wasn't cheap. It wasn't like three bucks a tube. This, the, the average order value was like 75 bucks, somewhere mm -hmm. around there, $80. Um, and so we were like, well, why were they doing this? 
Well, the bottom line is they they were treating themselves, right? This was a gift. This was to make them, they wanted to feel something when they used this skincare product. It was pampering. It was a gift. And so we were like, well, geez, we're sending this out all wrong. We're just throwing this in a boring brown box, you know, not to pick on Amazon, but a very Amazon-esque, you know, it's just a brown box with a bit of paper inside it. Uh, actually, there were the plastic bubble things. And throw those inside and away it goes. And we used the brown box because it was much better than our competitors who were sending them in the little bubble bags, you know, the jiffy bags. And so we were like, no, this is all wrong. This is actually all wrong. This is not what the customer wants from us. And so we did two things, okay? The first thing was we had some tissue paper cook, cut to the size of the box. And so we just inlaid a piece of tissue paper into the box. And so when we put the goods in, we folded over the tissue paper and sealed it with a sticker. So it felt like they were opening a gift, right? Tissue yeah. paper cost yeah. like a cent. It was mm -hmm. cheap as chips. The other thing that we did was we changed the packaging material um, because, you know, as a company, we liked the value of fun. We like to laugh a lot. We like to have a good time. Uh, we like to do stuff that's a little bit different. And we believe it or not, we, we, we like to be sustainable, even though we were using these large plastic bubbles. And we thought this is all wrong. And so for ages, I was brainstorming, what can I use as a packaging material that's going to help me here? And then one day... I had, you know, one of those moments, a, a sort of a brain fart where it just, pff, there it is. Uh, and I thought, let's try popcorn. And so we, we bought popcorn machines and we tried 20 different types of corn to find the right corn. Uh, obviously, there was no syrup on there or all that sort of stuff. It was just plain popcorn. But we put that in the boxes instead of the plastic bubbles. So can I tell you, right? The impact that one act had on our sales was unbelievable. Just using popcorn, which is a lightweight, biodegradable form of packaging, right, is highly sustainable because it's easy to grow. And so all I've got to do is pop the darn thing. So our warehouse smelled of popcorn just the whole time. And if which is like, awesome. Which is awesome. And if you wanted a low calorie snack, it was right there for you. <laughs> Uh, we did have to put a little note on the packaging saying, please don't eat this popcorn, feed it to the birds, but it's not really been <laughs> produced in a food safe environment because people were just taking photos of it, putting it on social media. They were writing things like, oh, I'm just sat here uh, eating the popcorn that came in my parcel with my granddaughter watching a movie. And we're like, no, 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 no. Oh. don't do that. But uh, everybody was talking about it on social media. And so. Um, in hindsight, what I should have done was rename the company. Uh, and if I ever go back into the beauty business, um, I'd, I'd do something and call it like popcorn beauty or something like that. And yeah. just tie the whole thing together because it was just brilliant, 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 brilliant. As a little add on, did you ever package some of the popcorn that people could pop and send it along? Ah, oh, you see now, Norm, you should, you should have given me that idea a few years ago. No, we didn't, but that's a great oh. idea. <laughs> that's that's a great story oh my gosh so if you're any of the listeners that are, are here right now we've got about 15 minutes left love to get some more comments or some questions that you can ask now you've heard a ton about being customer centric about some of the tips and tricks that are that we're doing please ask your questions this is an incredible topic and I'd love to hear from you. So let's go back to the customer centric part again. Love the stories that you've been helping us out with or, or talking about today. Can you give any action steps? Now, I know, Matt, this is like asking how long is a piece of string? <laughs> all right. You can go all different rabbit holes. But if somebody is listening today and they want to start and they get, yeah, like you said, their touch points, are there other, like, is there a straight PDF or action step that they can do? Like top three or top four action steps that they can do to easily implement this system that you're talking about? Yeah, the way I would do this, the way I'd approach it is I'd make a list of my touch points. Then I'd, I'd ask myself two questions. Where are the quick wins? Yep. Um, so what can I quickly change and adapt in my business? Okay. Um, because you'll, you'll see some you'll see some stuff where you if, if you're reading through that and you're going, well, if I'm the customer, what would I want here? 
And am I getting it? Yes or no? And you're going to quickly kind of go, well, yeah, that's great. Nah, that's a bit meh, right? And if you're not sure, the second thing that I would be doing, and you mentioned this earlier, is I would be ordering that product from all of your competitors. And I'd be going through all of their reviews. Um, and even if, you, if you're an established business, I'd be reading through all your reviews as well and find where the common problems are. Mm -hmm. um, because that is an instant fix, right? And you can solve that problem pretty much straight away. And some of it, well, a lot of it actually doesn't have to cost you any money. So um, if you go through, say, your customer comments and your reviews and your, your uh, competitors' reviews, and you find that there are the three top questions that people ask, well, sure, it's content marketing, but it's also customer service if I go and put those questions on my website and answer them. Or even just do like a like you're doing a Facebook live or a YouTube live or an Instagram live. Just going right. This is question number one. Let's talk about that. Um, and these things, I think, there's. I mean, there's a massive crossover between customer service and marketing. Uh, I think are sort of easy fixes. So you want the quick wins, right? So go down your list. What's the quick wins? And the other thing that you're looking for is um, you're looking for the Pareto you know, item, the 80-20, the, the, the right. one thing that you're going to do that's going to give you the big bang, right? The, the maximum bang for your book. What is that? Uh, what's that going to be? And how do you implement that? How do you, how do you get on that? So if you ask the question over and over again, what would I want in this situation? It will guide you and it will give you the answers, especially if you're mixing that with the reviews. And you'll get four or five things which you can action straight away on your business. The first things you're going to check going to be your homepage. The first thing that people see, the title, the imagery, what's going on there. Obviously, how easy is it for people to navigate your website? But think about your opening experience, right? So that would be the second area that I would look at. Once somebody gets the parcel from me, what is it like? Um, you know, what's it like to open this parcel? What can I do? which just really helps me separate out from the competition, which is so cool and so unique, um, makes me stand out. What's your popcorn in effect? And if you look at your homepage, you look at the uh, open experience, those two things will make a huge difference. And the third thing that I'd probably look at straight away would be your follow-up sequences. So somebody's got an email, or someone's ordered from you a product, how are you engaging with them after they've purchased that? What's the sequence like? What's that process? Uh, so if someone's ordered from you this uh, mud, this face mud, mm -hmm. you could very easily go, right, what I, what I want if I'd ordered that and I'm spending a lot of money is I want someone to send me more information. So I'm going to get an email, one email every day for the next seven days from the company telling me something about the product, showing me how to use it. Uh, maybe making me think about something else. And if I did, do you know what I mean? These sort of seven steps. And so I'm not only getting the product, I'm getting all this added value from the company as well. So yeah, they're, for me, they're the three things, um, the three areas that I would look at. What are your quick wins? Where can you deep dive into your homepage, your open experience and the post purchase sequences? Perfect. Do you use any form of technology to help out with your becoming customer centric uh no uh, the no. telephone uh bizarrely <laughs> the telephone which I, I i mean you laugh and i laugh you know I'm a, I'm a certain age i'm a man of a certain age and it's um it's what always amazes me is how unwilling people are under the age of i'm gonna guess 30 35 to use the telephone to actually call somebody and speak to a human being uh, it's remarkable. They'll text them, they'll email them, but it's a real big fight to call them. And actually just talking to somebody makes all the difference in the world. So I would say the telephone is your greatest ally. It's funny that you uh, mentioned that. Uh, I started out in promotions in the uh, incentive business, so okay. selling trinkets and trash. And I did this to a lot of telecommunications companies. And when voicemail, this is how old I am, when voicemail, for, uh, I'm I'm a product of the rotary phone. So, <laughs> <laughs> but uh, but anyways, when voicemail came out, I thought this was going to be a bomb. Who wants to talk to a machine? I want to talk to somebody in person. Mm -hmm. And yet it, it took off and it really did change the world. And I also thought that about text. So that's how good I am at predicting, predicting the future. But um Picking up the phone, it might be tough to do. 
But if you're calling even your customers, instead of sending them an email, but a follow-up just to thank them for their order, that's another way of like really like reaching out, like you said, just giving them that little bit of extra love that nobody does. That could be that, that could be a game changer. Yeah. Yeah, it really can. Even so, even simple things like sending videos rather than emails. Yeah, it, everyone can do it now. So why would you yeah. not? Right. It's just don't I think. On all these things, you know, when you're thinking about the quick win, one of the one of the uh, exercises that you can do is to ask yourself, what's the default? What's what's the default action that people take in this scenario? And how can I make that better? Or how can I change that? How can I do it a little bit differently? That will have that extra sort of va va boom, as it were. Right. But it's not going to necessarily cost me you know, too much money, but it's, it, it probably costs you something. You've got to invest in it. It's a form of marketing in, in some respects, but you know, what can you do that's within your grasp, that's within your resource? Uh, I, and I think there's all kinds of things you can do. Maybe one day, Norm, we should talk about why every e-commerce business should have their own podcast uh, on this sort of same vein, but that, that's another story. You know, it's. Uh, well, you know what? That gets me to uh, get you to come back. <laughs> <laughs> part two stay tuned part two uh okay so it looks like there is a couple of questions here kelsey can we start with those please okay yes uh let me get to them we've got a couple questions here the first one is let me see how do you target an audience when we're having a pioneering product uh, it's new to the market and it's never been seen before Okay, uh, that's an interesting question. Um, how do you target an audience when you're having a pioneering product new to the market? Well, first, and I, I don't mean to be blunt, I've never actually come across, across a pioneering product that's never been seen before. Um, I think there are features of products that have never been seen before, uh, but I, I don't know, Norm, maybe you have, I don't know. Is there a product that you've ever not seen before that's sort of, Everyone's gone, well, my, my mind's totally blown here. Yeah, there's always an extension of, I, I, I think, of a product. But uh, one of the things that if you are launching a product that might be unique, like let's mm. say you, you can go over to a Kickstarter account and you can see very unique products, mm. uh, you better know who your demographic is. Mm -hmm. So that that's one thing that uh, I I think is very important is that and you can go over uh, I've mentioned this app before you can go over to um, Spark Toro mm -hmm. and you know check out all of your competition mm -hmm. who their influencers are and uh, who they're following and then you can kind of get an idea but I don't know about you Matt but if I don't know my audience and I'm just doing a shotgun approach that's a recipe for disaster well it is i mean for me you've got to understand your audience defines your brand right so you've got to know your audience to know your brand and you can't launch without the brand so you've got to do that research and so the reason why i was being a bit pedantic about this product is brand new never seen before is actually i think there's something uh there's always something which is close to it which you can go and find out about um, and I saw in the comments, someone said, let's say hoverboards. And I'd be like, well, I'll just go and target everybody that's a Back to the Future fan. <laughs> <laughs> if that's the case. Um, but I think, like you say, Norm, you've got to find out who your demographic is going to be before you launch anything. And the way that I would do that is look at the demographics of similar products around me. And I would do things like we have a big document. We use Keynote for this. And it's a really great tool for just all we do is we spend hours going on Google uh, looking at images and we're like right so this is um aimed at people who are say in their 30s who are mildly successful and blah 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 and so we'll ask questions like well who who where do they go to eat meals what what kind of restaurants do they go to what kind of clothes do they wear what stores do they shop in and we have all these questions where do they go out who do they hang out with what kind of cars do they drive what does their house look like and and we compile all these images <clears throat> And after a good day or two of doing that, you'll know everything you need to know about your ideal client, what colors they like, what textures they like, what fonts they like, what kind of uh, logos they like, how your website should work, 
everything will come out of that research. Very good. Yeah. And that's just building the demographic, building that persona. And you might have multiple personas uh, per, mm -hmm. uh, per product as well. But uh, yeah, I like uh, research. Mm -hmm. Holy can't crap. Escape it. We're talking yeah. about research. <laughs> it works. Who knew, right. right? Who knew? Yeah. Our uh, next question is from Claudia. Have you ever used crowdfunding like Kickstarter to launch products? Do you think it's a good way to start a brand? Well, hey, Claudia. I personally haven't uh, used Kickstarter. I've bought products off Kickstarter, but I've never crowdfunded. Um, I have a slightly different philosophy. So, Norm, I don't know if you've done that. No, but we've brought on uh, Vance Lee. He did a webinar the other day just showing Amazon sellers the benefits of crowdfunding and really just funding your new idea mm -hmm. uh, without having to buy the inventory. So I think Kelsey, you have the link to that. He did a really great job, but no, I haven't by the way. Yeah. And we yeah. are, we are after that webinar, uh, Kelsey and I were talking about um, doing a product um, that's more of social that has a bit of, more social consciousness behind it. Mm -hmm. And uh, we're going to give it a shot. Yeah, oh, great. Do it, man. I'd be, yeah. I'd be curious. I really would be curious to see. I, it's one of those things where I've kind of thought about it off and on over the years, but I've just been so busy with all the other stuff. I've never I sort know. of got around to it. But I know for a lot of people it works. I think for me, if I was going to do it, uh, do the crowdfunding thing, I would probably go into it with the mindset that I'm probably not going to make that much money on the first output right so by the time i've paid kickstarter by the time i've done this that and the other and done all the advertising and promotion um because you're still going to have to do advertising and promotion on kickstarter on you it's not like it's build it and they will come so after i spend the money i'm probably not going to have a whole lot of cash left so i need a really great system of recording my customers engaging them building that community so that when i come up with an upsell or a cross sell or the second version of that product i've got an army of people ready to buy it and that's where i'll where i'll probably make the profits yeah mm -hmm. all right uh next i guess this is more of a comment uh this is from rich who used to be a, a dentist but he said we used to do patient follow-ups that went above and beyond uh not only for post-ops but for new patients um so just some crossover there uh we've got a couple of questions from bronwyn all the way from australia uh let's see how can you get a 3pl to be customer centric uh when posting out uh my product uh do you have any recommendations that's another great question. And I think 3PLs are becoming much more aware of this now. Um, a few years ago, I think it was quite hard. It was very rigid. It's like, no, this is our system. This is what we're going to do. Deal with it. Um, but I think now there's, a, there's so many fulfillment companies out there that you can use. You just have to shop around to get someone <clears throat> that sort of matches and meets your values and what you're trying to do and, and help you do what it is that you're trying to do. Um, and if you really can't, if you get totally stuck and no one can do it, uh, then I would I would look to build my customer centricity in other areas for now um, and build that out until I could either find a 3PL that would work or do what I did, which was just bring it all in house. And then I had total control. And with a with a 3PL, you this is where the phone can come in. You could do the Zoom meetings. Mm -hmm. You can have a set qu a group of questions that you're talking to them about. Um, even after, let's say that uh, they have a new service or it's a monthly charge, you can go to, oh, what's it called? Uh, you can add it right to your email. It's, um, it's a video app. I want to say, v anyways, I'll make sure I get this into the group, but this is good for Amazon sellers, e-com sellers, but it's also good for any service company that you could just say, hey, thanks a lot, blah, 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 or have your customer service say, team just you know thank the person uh, personally for buying your product. And 3PLs, that's something that uh, nobody's doing, and mm -hmm. I think that would be a bonus. The other thing is, just like you said, if you could find something unique, Popcorn, if you could find something unique, and just let your um, 
your uniqueness almost speak for itself. Mm -hmm. That's another form of customer service. Mm -hmm. So anyways, 3PLs, I, I think could be, I own a 3PL with Alpha Lobby. And I know there's a lot of people out there that um, are looking for quality service. That's mm -hmm. lacking in the business right now. It is, but I, I, like you say, shop on, like you, I own a 3PL. Here in the UK, we distribute for people all over the world. And um, we have one client who was really specific on the type of materials that we packed with, and we had to make it work for them. You know, it was just, it is what it is. You know, you, you've got to pack with these particular products. Okay, well, mm -hmm. no problem. Um, but so it's, I think you'll find somebody that will help you uh, deliver something once you've got your idea, as long as your idea, you know, works with them. But yeah, get on the phone, have a conversation. Yeah. The other thing I'd do is find out who their customers are, order from their websites to see how they actually do the fulfillment in real life. Ah, good point. Okay, uh, last question is in the same vein about um, 3PLs or uh, distribution. But uh, do you recommend having your product distribution in-house to ensure high quality customer touch points? Um. Uh, I think, again, the answer to that question is it depends. Um, and I appreciate in-house uh, distribution is not actually possible for everybody, but I think there is a tipping point when for your business, it kind of goes, well, can I do this in-house now for sort of economic reasons? Does it fit, et cetera, et cetera? And if you can, then I would always, always, always have in-house. I'd have my own in-house developers. I'd have my own in-house team. I'd, I'd have everything in-house in some respects because you have way more control. That said, um, I think if I was going to pull anything in-house out of my big long list of things that you can outsource, the first thing I would probably try and import would be the warehouse distribution because I'm such a fan of creating a wow opening experience. Mm. Um just from my just I can tell you the stories you know of, of of how my business has been affected by doing just that and I think if you can do that um that for me always makes a lot of sense but I appreciate it's not actually a straightforward thing to do okay, okay. great and we had one question for Norm that came in uh this is from Chuck does only worldwide check the boxes on customer service you were talking about I think that most of the questions, uh, there's variables. So you have to remember with every customer, there's a variable. And so depending on the customer service, maybe it'll fit one, maybe it'll fit the other. But we try, and anybody who knows Alpha Lobby, um, he goes out of his way and we try for our team to go out of our way to make sure that from our end, the customer service is there, even just clean boxes and just making sure that things are presentable. Uh, and I'm sure, Matt, you do the same thing out of your fulfillment center. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, we do. Yeah, 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 absolutely. You know, again, I, I cannot begin to tell you how important this opening experience is for your e-com business. Every, every interaction that a customer has up until this point, all your touch points are the digital ones up till here. The, the moment they get that box is the first time it becomes real, that pixels become reality. And that is such an important part in this whole customer journey and that whole transaction. Uh, so I'm very aware of that. And so, yeah, even down to the shipping companies you use, you know, um, mm -hmm. cheapest is not always best and most expensive is not always best. What's best is who gets a parcel there in a way that actually works for your customer, you know, and you have to understand that. And so, um, so yeah, that, that whole side of things, I think you, you're right. Norm. We, we, we think about it a lot. Right. Okay. Matt, you're off the hot seat. Oh, wow. Was that it? <laughs> yeah. You can sit back and you can relax and, <laughs> <laughs> but I do want you to, to, to come back and talk about some other topics. This was great. You're so easy to talk to. It was fantastic. Oh, bless you. No, Norm, I've honestly really enjoyed it. You're a great guy. And I have, I have severe beard, beard envy, but that's okay. <laughs> I'll, I'll, I'll get over that. Um, you've never seen the wheel of Kelsey. Uh, we'll, we'll be cutting over that in a second. So if you are a new listener, just type in hashtag wheel of Kelsey and tag two people, and you can get a second entry. Uh, Kels, can we go to our last sponsor? 
This episode is brought to you by Clear Ads. Looking to maximize your Amazon ads ROI? Well, whether you need full service or just one or two services, Clear Ads Amazon advertising experts drive outstanding results across the Amazon marketplace. With over nine years of experience, their Amazon PPC managers have helped thousands of companies to drive down their cost of sales and scale up their revenue, profits, and orders. And with their unrivaled Amazon DSP expertise, ClearAd's DSP services are tailored to your brand. You really can't go wrong. Get in touch today with ClearAd's dedicated team by visiting the link in the description or visiting clearads.co.uk. And remember, more sales, better ROI, incredible growth. Check out ClearAds today. All right, Matt, stand back. You've never seen this before. The I'm ready. I'm you. ready. <laughs> All right. We've been really building this up for Matt, so I, I hope you enjoy. Uh, here we go. The Wheel of Kelsey. It's time for the Wheel of Kelsey. Oh, All my. right. <laughs> that was awesome. Uh, okay, okay, let's let me... spin this wheel. Yeah, like uh, our who is this? Who that said it? Um, we had someone say volume warning. Um, we True. yeah from Yanni. It's uh, yeah, it comes in loud. We and get clear. your attention. <laughs> yeah. All right. So thank you everyone who entered today's uh, giveaway. We do this every single podcast. So if you don't win today, you can uh, come back on Wednesday and enter again. And uh, let's see who today's winner is. If you are the winner, please email me k at lunchwithnorm.com. Who got it? And it looks like Bronwyn. Oh, very good. There you go. Ah, from Australia. Yes. Yes. Awesome. All right. So does that mean Bronwyn's going to be, is this the cohort thing we were talking about? Yes. Yes. Awesome. Bronwyn, looking forward to seeing you in there. Be great. Yeah, absolutely. That's a great prize. So congrats, Bronwyn. All right. Like I said, Matt, you're off the hook. I am going to ask you to come back, though. I hope you're going to oh, accept. No, yeah. <laughs> Absolutely, totally. Uh, I'll I'll be there definitely. Yeah, yeah. It's just oh. been honestly, it's been great. You're, you you guys are easy to talk to. And that wheel thing, oh my goodness, my eyes are still hurting. But I thought it was brilliant. <laughs> thank you. All right. Thank you, sir. Before we get going, we, what's that? Um, before we get going, uh, Matt, how can people get a hold of you? Oh yeah, uh, if yes, they're interested. Yes, yes. Oh, sure. Yeah, you can uh, head over to my website, mattedmondson.com. Uh, all the links to my companies, the cohort, my social media, all of that's on there. Reach out, come and say hi. Uh, tell me you watch the podcast. It'd be great to hear from you. And those guys that didn't win on the wheel of, what do you call the wheel of Kelsey? I almost said the wheel of fortune. <laughs> that's not it. No, the wheel of Kelsey. If you just tip me up on social media, we'll be able to get you some kind of special discount or something, I'm sure. But um, yeah, it's been uh, it's been great. So just head over to mattedmondson.com. Perfect. And uh, Kelsey, uh, thanks for interrupting. I'm, I'm used to it. Uh, you know, it's, it's okay. Welcome. It's okay. <laughs> All right, Matt, we will see you later. And uh, thanks again for coming on. Awesome. Bless you guys. Have a good day. All right. All right. Okay, Thanks, everybody. Thank you. I hope you enjoyed today's episode. I thought it was fantastic talking about becoming customer centric. It's so important, not just getting, you know, a great product or knowing your numbers. This is another area of the, uh, the whole journey that you have to do. People don't like your product people or your, 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 um, your customer experience. They open up your packaging and it sucks guess what? You're not going to get that customer back again. But if they enjoy it and it looks like a quality brand and it's packaged well and it looks like you put some little bit of thought behind it and you care for your customer, you'll continue to get sales. And they're going to tell people, just like what Matt was talking about with helping that person out, writing the card, getting them some chocolates and making sure it got there. That is customer centric. So anyways, just wanted to talk to you a little bit more about that. Also, our next uh, podcast on Wednesday is going to be awesome. I've got a buddy of mine. He's from Canada. His name's uh, Greg, Greg uh, Potapenko. 
Uh, I've known him for years now, and this guy knows his stuff. We're going to be talking about most likely yeah, he can change it up. He, he's he, he's just like a wealth of knowledge, but he's an incredible external traffic guy. He's been doing it for years. Wait till you hear this guy's story. It's it it really is second to none. He's got a crazy crazy story that he can tell you um, how he came over uh, from another country. I didn't know how to speak the language. I'm gonna let him tell it, but uh, it'll be a very interesting podcast for sure. All right, Kels, where are you? All right. Well, I uh, hope you enjoyed today's episode. Make sure to give us a thumbs up and a like if you enjoyed it. Uh, if you're watching from YouTube, uh, make sure you subscribe down below, hit that button, and uh, ring the bell so you get all the notifications when we go live. Uh, and we do have a Facebook group uh, where you can engage with the community. That's our Beard Nation, our Beardos. So that's where everyone hangs out. Uh, and you can talk about the episodes, uh, talk about topics that you want us to talk about. Uh, also, just a great community um, and a place where you can ask your questions, get feedback on your business. You can share your successes. Um, just an awesome, fun place. So check it out. Lunch with Norm, Amazon, FBA, and e-commerce collective. And uh, if you do have any topics or guest suggestions for us, we're always listening. Uh, we want to make this the best podcast um, that we can. And so you can email me, k at lunchwithnorm.com. And uh, we'd be happy to uh, take a look at your suggestions and see how we can incorporate it into the podcast. So uh, it's always available, k at lunchwithnorm.com. And uh, I think that's it. Okay, very good. So... Thank you for joining us today. Uh, if you'd like to join us live every Monday, Wednesday, and Friday at noon uh, Eastern Standard Time, that would be awesome. We love live engagement. Uh, if not, you can always go to our social or to the podcast and, and listen, download it and listen. Also, uh, like Kelsey was saying, we've got an awesome community. The community is constantly growing in uh, the Facebook group. Uh, so please, Go over there, engage, ask questions. Uh, we love it. And as you can see, if it's not just me or Kelsey, there's a ton of people answering. So uh, we just love that engagement. So awesome. Thank you so much for being part of our group. And we will see you on Wednesday. Lunch with the, lunch with the, lunch with the.